I just want to um, say that this is brought um, through core programs. Uh, this is something, this video series is, is part of core programs, but we felt to show it on a Sunday morning, be, spe specifically, I should say, because of what has gone on um, with our previous services when we were talking about the difference between an orphan and a son, you know, or between uh, a, a way of thinking, like, oh, I'm always on the outs and God's not going to take care of me, and that negative kind of toxic thought versus a son just knows God's here for me. It's all going to work out in the end. No big deal. Well, when we gone through that series, it just really stuck out to us. No, we need to show this on, on a Sunday morning. So it is going to be a five-step thing, but four of those weeks will be the video with me talking a little bit, and then um, the fifth week will, will be me. And um, so I wanted to let you know this last week even, I had a uh, doctor give me a sheet on the brain, and he's kind of excited that we're showing this. And he just wanted people to know, he said, you know, the brain itself, if you've been in any amount of chronic pain, let's say that you, uh, you know, are in a pain emotionally over a long period of time, it can shrink the brain 11% within a year, within a year. If you, uh, I went through a situation where I had undiagnosed um, gallbladder attacks, and so it was like, no, they said there's no stones in there. They couldn't see anything. But I would keep having these gallbladder attacks. And this went on for two years. And so you can imagine I had to regrow some parts of my brain because just learning this, it's, there's parts that will just start shutting down. Emotional pain works very much the same way. If you're a person that's um, suffering with fibromyalgia, Many times what happens is emotional pain will be so great within us. We feel, you know, you really feel it right here in the deepest part of your spirit. That's what gives you that, ugh, I don't want to eat. I'm going through all this stuff kind of thing. And then what ends up happening is that will translate into the body, into the fibers and the tissues and into your nervous system as pain, pain, pain. And so when you're not even having a bad day, you might be feeling fibromyalgia. So there's so much that has to do um, with the brain, it's not just a gray matter. That's a component, you know, hanging around there. There, um, what she's going to be going through and showing us in these different steps is the first step will be how thoughts form. So today you're going to get to see how the very thoughts set up in your brain. And, you know, that's just really important to be able to understand ourselves. Um, Paul Hegstrom uh, is a doctor from uh, Colorado, and he said this. He said, it's the things that you can understand that you can handle the things that you don't understand that drive you crazy. So just knowing how we work can bring a peace to ourselves where we don't, you know, sit and condemn ourselves for different things and, and um, you know, be frustrated or be, you know, in Christianity, a lot of times we'll war or try to war against something and we're going after that one thing and we're claiming every scripture and we're just at it and at it and at it when it very well could just be a different pathway that needs to be healed, a different approach that needs to be taken. Wouldn't that be wonderful, huh, to find that out? Some of us have had brain injuries if you've been in a car accident or, um, you know, uh, toxic fumes, been exposed to um, different chemicals, you know, drug abuse, any of that type of stuff. There is hope for your brain to rewrite that in the physical. And then there's a very spiritual side to who we are because we know when we step out of this body, this body is just dirt. It's going to fall down to the ground and our brain will fall down with it, right? But... This spirit that lives in this body empowers those different parts, and it fires up the different parts of the brain. And so it's really important to take care of our temple and to understand our temple and to know how this whole thing works so we don't become frustrated and then end up in more emotional pain. So this week is how a thought forms. Next week is how a stronghold forms. Now, a lot of times there's a misbelief uh, or a, a twisted conception that you know, a stronghold is just like that demon that's out there, you know. And every time I go to do something, there's this demon that sets up this stronghold in front of me. And I take authority over it, and I'm just hitting my head against that wall. But that demon is so powerful, so strong. Well, you know, that's just a, an off way of thinking. Because the Bible makes it really clear that the stronghold is located right here. Yeah. Yeah. It's right here. It sets up for us to not be able to believe past a certain point. Or it is a life command, like we call it in core programs, that is truth to us, but it could be a lie. And we're believing that. We're acting on that. That's a stronghold set up. Now, 
I'm not saying that demons don't enhance that kind of thing. They, like, they know if there's a stronghold going on by what comes out of your mouth. And so they like to dance around that and add to it and, you know, put their little flavor on it. But we'll end up battling out here when a big part of it is right here and being able to take down that stronghold. The next week we'll be talking about stress and the effects of stress on the brain. And then the, the week after that will be 13 steps that we go through to actually reroute and heal the brain. And then we're going to end it with healing of toxic thoughts. They are proving more and more now that um, we follow the underside of our brain, that emotional side, and it affects our physical body. And so we may be running all over to healing conferences and we might just need something renewed here, and then it will manifest quicker in our body. You know, if you have a self-hate, if you have bitterness, if you have been hurt and it's unresolved, it's like an aching wound that's in the inside of us, well, that's going to affect your physical body. The hormones get offset. Your thyroid gets offset. You might end up with headaches. There's all of that type of stuff, but many times when we have those symptoms, we separate those away from the problem. There's this problem going on. Man, I feel sick over here. It's really interesting in studies when people are going through um, poverty situations, maybe a person has lost their job, there has to be a, a big shift in what's going on. They have studied on families that it, it'll just be like, wow, all of a sudden people start getting sick in the family. They start having colds, ear infections. It's like, man, we don't need that right now. I just lost my job. Now I gotta take the kids to the doctor. They can feel the stress in the home and the body lowers its immunity and then the germs that are just living out here attack. It's as simple as that. But changing how we view things and, and changing how we come at some of this stuff is everything. So we're going to watch this video now. And I really encourage you to take notes. For those of you who've been on the mission field, you can deal with different accents quicker. She does have an accent, so you might have to sit on the edge of your seat and really turn up your ears to, to, to hear it. It's easy for me to understand, but maybe not everybody. Um, but this doctor is a wonderful blessing to the body of Christ. And so we'll go ahead with the video. While she was explaining detail to big picture, big picture to detail, something that frustrated me when our children were growing up is, and it's, it's the reason why, I just heard a statistic this last week, the American education system is causing our society to fall behind the rest of the world. We are not keeping up with the rest of the world anymore. And something that I noticed that I didn't understand, according to that, but when our children were in, in school, especially high school, the entire education system was using half their brain. Two plus two is four, okay? That's the detail to big picture. But why is two plus two to four? They couldn't answer the whys anymore. Algebra, for instance, this is how you do algebra. Well, tell me why it works that way. I don't know. They just said it works that way. There it is. We're only going detail to big picture. The why is, oh, I see the big picture, and I can reduce that back down to a detail again. We're dumbing ourselves down. And I've always said, well, our school system's dumbing us. They're dumbing us down. I mean, when I went to high school, not only did you have to know how it worked, you had to know why it worked that way. They don't need to know why anymore. All they need is a little calculator, push in the buttons, and it'll work. Now I understand. Isn't that good? Yeah. Now that's just opening this up. Now next week we're going to be getting into dealing with toxic thoughts and things like this. She's talking about educationally and showing how the brain works, but you also can run these same patterns emotionally. So if you say 2 plus 2 ne needs to equal 4, that's the big picture. Emotionally, we have sequences that are just like that. This plus this means I love. See? And love needs to equal this plus this. It runs, it runs that same way. Well, what ends up happening is our, our mind can be wired very intelligently on one hand, but if we're wired wrong emotionally because of all the past hurts or we're told we're stupid or we felt left out or abandonment or we could just keep naming all day long the negative things that sin has brought to this earth, then what ends up happening is sometimes we know how it's supposed to be, but we can't get that to happen for us. It's like, I can't figure that out, how I 
walk in that, how I'm a component, a part of that. I know it's supposed to be this certain way, but it just doesn't work for me. And we give up. We give up on emotional healing. We give up. Or we'll say, I've had so much hurt that really, is it going to take the rest of my life to get over this? Am I always going to be in this state of pain? Is this always going to be a re-triggering thing? Am I that controlled by my physical body? Because you literally will feel like your body's in charge, your emotional state's in charge, and you wake up in the morning afraid of you. A lot of times that will happen because it's like, I don't know where I'm going today, but I'm going to have to battle me to make sure this other part of me doesn't take off and just want to do all this stuff. And so this is many times where addictions come from. This is, you know, um, a lot of what's happening in the inside of us. Now, when she talked about those two sides working together, this is where double-mindedness does not work. The Bible talks about double-mindedness. A double-minded man should um, not think that he's going to receive what? Anything. And it's because we flow the best when, we're, when we flow in the way God created us. Faith works the best when we're in the way that God created us. But we many times get double-minded messages. And, and they kind of looked like to the brain, like if someone was to tell you you were good-looking, but they would do a different action at the same time. And that would look like, you're really good-looking. I mean, wow, I really think you look good in that outfit. It's like you're hearing one message, and the other message is like, what? Are you, okay, which one is it? And that ends up happening when we get damaged emotionally, whether it be incest, molestation, abuse, abandonment, like I said, being down-talked. Um, the other part that can cause the double-minded type of thinking is fear. Because when it's instilled into us when we're small that, you know, abuse is going to happen or you're just going to be forgotten or you're not taken care of, then fear causes us to not trust, right? So how can you run the sequences in both sides of the brain? You might know it might supposed to be going this way, but I'm not sure how that's all in the big picture. I'm not sure how that's going to be made to work. So what we do is we kind of cower within ourselves. And this is where isolation comes from. This is where we stop doing the things she just said. And those things were ask, answer, discuss. You know, in some churches, it's not really allowed to ask a question. Now, they don't usually stand up in front and say, I don't want any questions ever in this place. But it's just a known thing like, don't, don't ask. <laughs> just leave it alone. You're going to get shamed, embarrassed or something. Just don't. Just leave it alone. And so people don't ask. They got questions and they don't ask. Many times when we get to be junior high age, that's when our biggest questions about God come up. It's like when you're little, you're like, yeah, I get Noah's Ark. I get this. Yeah, it's a great story and I think it's fun and everything. But then when you get to be junior high age, you've grown enough to end right to say, well, how does that work? If God's a God of love, then why are there wars? Those are the kind of questions that come up for junior hires. And, and many times it's like, don't ask that. You're, you're going to look like the dumb one. You're supposed to somehow know that. Or it's just not allowed in a church setting. Or as parents, we don't know. Just believe in him. <laughs> don't, I don't go ask your father. You know, it's that type of thing. And there, the mind is trying to move ahead by doing those things. Ask, answer, and discuss. When we've been hurt emotionally, we say, I can't ask. I just can't. I'm going to get hurt more. That's how it's deducted in the mind. And then if we ask, we might ask it down a certain way or, or whatever, or we're thinking about asking, but we already believe within ourselves, there's no answer. I mean, I've been trying to solve this for years. There's just no answer. That's our dendrite. That's our, our, our thorny bush that we really believe that there's no help for us. Now, there might be help for you guys, but in, you know, if you had the same thing, but not for me. I'm different because I've gone after this and I've gone after and it's never worked for me. There's never been an answer. And I feel like I've asked and asked and asked. And sometimes we'll feel like we're asking the questions, but it never really comes out our mouth think about it. It's like, I have gone before God. Really? When? How often? I have researched. Really? When? A lot of times in our emotional state, what we'll do is we'll feel like we're really trying to communicate and ask questions and everything. We might ask one or two times. Or the Bible says, ask, seek, and knock. And what it means in the original language is ask. Ask again. Ask. Ask some more. Ask, ask, ask. Until you get your answer. Seek. Look, 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 look. Knock. 
come on, come on, I got to have this opened up to me. And so there's a determination to be able to do that. But if we have learned that we can learn certain things down one way, but the big picture is not going to make sense in the end when we try to back it up the other way, it doesn't pay to talk about it. It doesn't pay to try more than one time. And so we'll stop asking, we'll stop looking for the answer, and so then there's no discussion. What also happens when there's no discussion is we feel relationally left out. Think about that. Even with God, if you shoot a question up to him and like, God, why is this happening? Then we just go on with our day, you know, because we're not really expecting an answer. We're just kind of venting is kind of how we look at it. We feel cut off by him. We, we haven't really had a discussion. If I come in, I want to ask my husband something, or I'm really hurt in an area, and I, and I just say, honey, I don't know why this is happening to me. And he just sits quiet, and I go and do my own thing. There's no connection. There's no discussion. There's no, how are we going to work through this? What is the two plus two that equals four? And why on this side, what is the, the equation on this side? Does four come from those two plus two? See, there has to be that type of thing. And a lot of times in marriage, that's our, our biggest fight is be we feel left out by that other person because there's no discussion. And if there is, there's not a lot of real questions asked. There's a lot of finger pointing and you did and I never and you always and that type of stuff. But there's not that sequence that says, okay, I'm going to ask. Why are you saying what you're saying? Why do you feel the way you feel? Explain to me. We're going to look for an answer. There is going to be a way out of this situation. We're going to make this work. There's not a lot of that type of thing that ends up happening. And then the long-term discussion doesn't happen, and we feel cut out. So this is kind of when we deal with the orphan versus the son. The son can go to the father and say, hey, Dad, let's talk about this. And they already are secure. There's going to be dinner conversations. There's going to be, hey, we're working together conversations. There's going to be those kind because that's my father. The orphan doesn't talk much. Not a lot of asking questions. Well, I'm going to assume what I think he wants because I really don't want to get in his space. I'm not really sure he's going to want to give me an answer. I don't know that I feel really attached to him anyway. And I I don't want to get in a big discussion. So I'll assume this is what he wants and I'll go do it. See the difference? The mind is grown out of abandonment instead of out of that security that says two plus two equals four, and also four comes out of those components. The same thing, and it's mirroring those pictures back. And a lot of times we'll get to be, you know, I've said, she said 18 years of age is it takes for your brain to come to uh, the fullness is how I would say that. But 25 years is what it takes to wire the main pathways. And a lot of times when I say that in classes, and you're 26, people are like, oh, man. I'm like, wired already. I'm done. I'm done. There's, you know, what are you going to do? I got 26 years of all this. And and, uh, when really, by starting to ask, answer, and discuss, you'll just grow new dendrites. And we're going to be showing you how to do that. It's called getting your mind renewed, being transformed, and having a renewed mind. God knew all about that when he put the word of God together so that we'd be able to just trust in that and say, okay, God, renew my mind. But we have to step out, out of mistrust, out of fear, and be able to start asking. Sometimes when we ask questions, the biggest fear, like say if you want a yes on something, then the thing you fear the most is what? No. I'm like, oh, I don't want to, because they're probably going to say no. And then what's going to happen? You're like going to fall over dead? You're just going to die at that moment. It's going to just be over. We fear certain answers. And so we may ask the question, and the question may be no. We'll ask a different one and keep building around that. Well, if it's no here, then how does that work? And how can we get this to, to move? But a lot of times we'll settle on, I asked the question one time, it was a no. I didn't really get a good feeling about it. I guess we're done. And then that whole section of your life or that whole thing that really needed to be resolved was just kind of thrown to the side. So we need to ask, answer, and discuss. This is why it's important to communicate with our children. The more I learn, the more I kick myself for, you know, it's like, oh, I did that right, but I did about 100 and 
50 other things that, uh, you know, needed to be improved when my kids were little. It's like, oh, to really be able to listen to their questions. No question's a dumb question. They're really trying to grow those, those dendrites, and they're really trying to get that security that says, I can ask anything, and I know I'm going to get an answer, and if I don't understand that, we're going to discuss it, and it's going to build, and that'll be a good memory, and the dendrites will be free to, to go ahead and do this. So this happened, and I read this to the prayer group. There was a prophecy that came forward, I believe, looking for the date here. It was in 07. Yeah, June 3rd of 07. And it's a big old long prophecy, but I'm just going to um, read a section of it. It's, sa- it's trying to get the church ready that we find healing so that we can bring healing to other people. And it says they will need to be in position for this harvest to be brought in and not lost. Because with this harvest, there will be demonic like this earth has never seen. This end time revival. There is going to be that type of, this is no easy revival, is kind of what he's saying. Um, Sin has perpetuated on the earth. And so to help people, we're going to be dealing with demonic like this earth has never seen. There will be broken and torn and twisted and maimed minds and emotion as this earth has never seen. People who will literally need their physical brain remade. The Lord talked to us about that already years ago. And um, I, that came to my mind, and I mentioned it to Pastor, and he went through all the prophecies and stuff and found that. Um, we literally need to have our mind remade in certain areas. Right? And I think, to, how many here think that you, you, you're learning properly? Like when she describes how the brain's supposed to work, you're like, yeah, that's me. I'm like all over it. Yeah, we have some. But it's very few. It's, it's a way of learning that we need to switch over to. And some may say this, that, you know, why are you guys bringing this up at church? I think this is a little kind of weird. Aren't we supposed to be talking about the apostles or Noah or something like that? I mean, isn't that what you do at church? We are made in the image of God, and yet we don't know what that image works like, how that operates, and how our physical body plays a part to do in that. It's our temple. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't know how our temple is supposed to operate. And so we, we kind of step outside and say, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Like we're trying to separate away from the very thing we're housed in. We need to understand the very thing we're housed in and let the spirit of God that's in us, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, when you know him and you've asked him to forgive your sins and come into your life, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. He will quicken your mortal body. It's going to bring healing. He's going to rewire things. Isn't that exciting? So she moves pretty quick through these. Um, so you might have been like, oh, hold on. I'm trying to take notes. And, and uh, if you have questions, though, um, in the weeks to come, I'm going to open it up in the end for questions. And we may be praying for some people. And so I just wanted to, to let you know that that might be what's, what's going to be happening. Because we want to learn how to, what, ask Right? You can do that in church? Ask a question. You're not going to get shamed. It's not going to be a bad experience or whatever. I might be the one going, I don't know. We've got to find that answer out. I don't know. But we need to be able to ask and have permission to grow and permission to pursue how we operate and, and how this has worked together. The one last thing I wanted to say is this. We, our spirit knows that we've been... Um, affected by sin. Of course, our spirit is the deepest part of our spirit. Proverbs describes is right here. And we're housed in this dirt body. And of course, when this body falls off onto the ground, our brain housing will go with it. That, and we'll be standing there, right? We're spirit beings. It knows that we're having to deal with this. The spirit of God dwells here in us and is trying to get stuff over to us all the time. He's trying to get those thought patterns over to us all the time. But we have belief systems that may be set up that have put a limit. And that's what next week we're going to be talking about. Wherever you're limited in your thinking that says this will never, I can't see where that will happen, it's not for me, any of that kind of stuff, um, wherever you're limited, that's a stronghold. That's a stronghold that God wants to tear down, right? 
Okay, so this is what the word salvation means. There's many different meanings in the depth of if you look it up, but one of the big meanings for it is to take the limits off. So religiously, when we come before God, there may be an altar call, and they say, anyone here, they usually say it this way, want to receive Christ. Really what we're trying to say is, does anyone want to acknowledge him that he's going to forgive my sins and our sins right here and right now? And apply that and let that happen. That's really what we're saying, to be able to allow that to happen. That is the first step to change. Now, I'll tell you what Paul Hegstrom, he's a friend of ours from Colorado. He um, he's a doctor and very much about the brain. He said this. He said that the brain itself can be rerouted. He said, once we've learned this and getting the components going together and taking the limits off, literally addressing the spiritual side to it and saying, I choose to believe again. I choose to put my faith in God again or whatever. He said, you can do an MRI on a person and you can do it after they come to know him and the brain looks different. He says, totally different brain. It's like all of a sudden there's this fire in there. There's this lit up area and people are like, whoa. You know, so, and they said, it changes the components in your blood. Your blood looks different. When you come from, I don't know if there is a God. I'm not sure about him. I know I feel icky inside at times. I know I feel unsettled and I'm not at peace, but I'm not sure about this God thing. There's a whole turmoil inside of us. When our heart and our thalamus in our brain even is wired with all the hardware that says we need God. Whether we're taught that from the time we're little or not, it's in there. That's why there's that void, that craving, that that part that says, I need the limits off of my life. We live in a sin-filled world, right? And sin does this. It puts limits on you. In fact, Proverbs says it'll make you think stupid. It It uses the word stupid. It'll make you think stupid. So when we participate in it or someone sins against us and we don't know what to do, especially when we're a kid or whatever, and that's all taken in, the effects of that come on us and we can end up thinking stupid thoughts like God doesn't care about me. I don't even know if there is a God. I just don't care anymore what happens to me. I'm just going to go get drunk tonight. It makes sense to us at that moment because we're thinking like sin wants us to. It's affecting. It's causing thorns to grow where there should be trees. And so we, we know that coming before him and saying, God, I, I just need my heart changed. I need the sin effect washed off of me. Really what we're saying is forgiveness needs to happen for us. And God's saying, yeah, I, I, I did that on the cross. I died for you so that forgiveness had come and remove the power of that. And all of a sudden, now we're not in that limited thinking anymore. Suddenly, if we were thinking stupid, suddenly we're like, wait wait a second. Something could be different for me. And it changes it. And they can see it on an MRI. And they see it in the blood components when they check your blood after you give your heart to God. And you say, which basically is a term that means I'm just giving my will over to you, God. And I'm going to choose to believe I want to know what you know. I want your character. I want your forgiveness. I want the power of this stupid sin off my life. When we do that and we get that removed, your very blood components, when they look at the cells themselves, it changes in operation. Isn't that awesome? It's only awesome if we're on the other side of that saying, the limits are coming off. The limits are coming off of my life. The limits are coming up. But if we're still in that spot where it's, I don't know. I, I don't even know if there is a God. I don't even know if I'm worth caring about. I mean, really, it's been 30 years. It's been this long with this problem. Like I'm actually going to get healed. Like it's actually going to change. When we get in that way of thinking, we are thinking thorn thinking. It's toxic. And it comes from the power of sin messing with us. The only way you get the power of sin off is through forgiveness. Whether someone sinned against you, or you participated in it. It's still the same power, and it's got to go. So it'd be like if I offend Marsha, and I'm just mean, and I just, you know, uh, and I say something to her or whatever, and she receives that, and it's like, how could she hurt me that way or whatever? And maybe even some bitterness starts to grow. It's going to put a limit on her life because I sinned against her. 
It'll put a limit there. If we allow that kind of stuff to come in, it'll start growing those thorn bushes, and we won't think the same way God created us to think. I have everybody stand right now. Now, religiously, if you've been to church at all, this is the part when you say stand, then people have a few thoughts. Your dendrites say right away, they're either going to have a prayer line, there's going to be this, and then we go kind of down the little thing. I'm not asking anybody to come to the front. I'm just asking you this question. I just want everybody to close your eyes. And the reason we do that is you're really kind of shutting down all that extra firing of the brain so that you can hear the deepest part of you. That's that, that gut part of you where there may be lack, there may be hurting. There may be that confusion. There may be that double-minded feeling of, I don't even know anymore. I'm not sure what to believe. There are all of those types of things. What we're going to do right now is I'm, I'm just going to pray over everybody that wants prayer um, just by you raising your hand. Everyone's eyes are closed. And that would be, um, I need you're saying within yourself, I need the power of sin off of me. I don't care if you, you say, well, I've been saved for 10 years. You know, I don't care. It still can get on you. And, and we need the limit off. If you're limited in any area and you're saying, I want that off of me. I want that off of whether I participated or somebody spoke it to me or it's just plain I'm not getting where we're going because the wisdom has not settled yet and, and I've got all this confusion around me. I want it gone. So I see some hands, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that just shows a lot of us are dealing with this. And so, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Now, I'm praying, but you posture yourself within your heart. And let your spirit cry out to him inside. Father, we're just asking that the great sending away is what the word um, forgiveness means, is a great sending away. The power of it, the thought might still be there, but the power that's there generated by sin, because your word says the wages of sin is death. Sin itself starts to make you think stupid. There is a spiritual power here, Lord God. We're asking forgiveness right now. And you can verbalize that to whisper it to him. You say, God, forgive any of this that's on me. And I choose to forgive those who sin against me. It doesn't mean you don't have boundaries in your life. It just means you're choosing to send that away. I don't want the power of that on me. I don't want it. Go, go, go. I'm asking, Lord God, that your power and your spirit, your way of thinking, come in and change me. Come in and change me. Step by step, little by little, a lot by a lot. Let the limits come off in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, you may be seated. For some of you, that may be just the first time you've ever prayed a prayer like that or just even acknowledged that. We're looking for the limits to come off. Here's what's religiously taught, though. Well, we prayed the prayer, so we're done. No, you, you have to get your mind renewed. We have to start thinking to You've got to hang with people who think differently than the people you were hanging with. There's all kinds of changes that need to be made. And this is where she said it's the student who has to posture themselves to learn. There's people like myself, we facilitate, right? But you have to take the initiative and say, I am going to go about this change. How do you eat an elephant? But one bite at a time. But by golly, we're going to eat one. Right? Yeah, we're going to start the process of taking the limits off. And it's going to be one step at a time. Do not set it up where it's a superhero. Everything's going to change overnight. But I can tell you what, it's going to start moving. If you posture yourself with God, like, God, I just need your grace and your mercy. Now, just one moment before we dismiss here. I just have a, a word for you and your wife. Um, and it's just something to help reroute some pathways the things that you feel you're responsible for, the things that, that keep going over you, that just keeps going after you, and especially you. It's like, this, I own this. This is mine. I'm supposed to grieve about it. I'm supposed to just feel sick about it. Or there's something wrong with me. There's some, I, I'm not a loving person then. I'm a person who doesn't, you know, even care. And, and what it causes is cause a huge burden to come on you. Um, and you're walking around carrying that. And not only are you limited then, 
for salvation to, to that power of God to come on you, you feel totally isolated. Where we know there is a God, we cry out to him. Why do we use the word cry sometimes? Because in our mind it's like, God, because we really feel he's that far away. It's that kind of crying out. It's, where are you in all of this pain? Where are you when he's here? He's here, and, and he just asked me to mention that to you so you would know that he's here and that he loves you and he cares for you. And that is going to work out. It's going to come together. You're not responsible for everything. You're not responsible for everything, okay? Sometimes we take that kind of stuff on, and then we, we just wear out a certain pathway in our brain because we can't think in those, both of those sides. We're just running that scenario over and over, and it hurts. So, Father, we just thank you that you're bringing about change. I believe right now there's going to be people coming out of drug situations just totally free. Totally free. Even how the drug itself, we wired the brain, we're going to grow a new dendrite. We're going to grow some big, big old healthy trees like a tree planted by the water. We shall not be moved. We shall not be moved. And we thank you, Lord God, that you're going to grow those in us as we make the effort to reach out to you. I believe also, Lord God, that there is change going to happen in physical bodies that the heaviness of things is just going to come off and we're going to see things different. And it might not even happen at church. We might be at home alone and get a revelation of your love and who you are and suddenly we'll be lifted and free and the limits will just come off in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for those one-on-one experiences. Thank you, Lord. I believe, Lord God, that you're readying this body to gather around people who need a group to be around them. They've been isolated way too long. And Lord God, they need a group of people to say it's going to be okay and to believe with them. I believe that, Lord God. You're doing in this body. You're getting us ready. And I also believe, Lord God, that there are going to be actual brains healed. Healings take place. That maybe there was an injury and and, and it's dark in that area and suddenly it'll light up again. Suddenly it'll reroute and grow new pathways. We thank you for that, Lord God. And Father, anyone who suffers with seizures, in the name of Jesus, wow, especially we're in this anointing having to do with talking about the brains, Lord, I thank you that the healing power is here to be received for healing to happen in the name of Jesus. And newness will come come into place in the brain. Can you agree with me on that? Super on the natural. No one can take credit for it then. Just our God. So we know he's going to do this. And so this week, I challenge you to ask, answer, and discuss. I'm going to ask, and I'm going to get some answers, and then we're going to have a discussion. In your marriage, uh, if you want to email questions in to Pastor and I, you sure can do that. We can have discussions right here on Sunday morning. You know, I can bring some things up and say, well, this was asked. What do you think about this? As long as you feel safe doing that, I'm I'm game for that. We're going to do that. And we have the freedom and permission to grow. Did you have anything, love, before we? Father, we just thank you for this, this people that you've brought forward, Lord God, that we're here today, these divine connections, and we just ask you bless them and keep them. Make your face shine upon them. Be gracious unto them. Lift up your countenance on them and give them peace. In Jesus' name.